British Columbia and federal ministers on disaster response and climate resilience held their fifth and final meeting. Ministers Blair and Farnworth, who co-chaired the committee, will be delivering remarks, followed by Ministers Qualtro and Fajan, and then we'll proceed with questions from the media. Minister Blair, over to you. Thanks, Annie. Good afternoon. Bon après-midi. Uh, I, I want to thank you all for your patience. Uh, we've, we've been doing some very important work today. And before I begin my remarks, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh Nations. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the people of Lytton First Nation and the village of Lytton and their surrounding communities, as well as those in Matthias Kulum Cree Nation in northern Manitoba, who are currently grappling with devastating impact of wildfires. And I'd like to also thank the firefighters, the first responders, and all emergency management officials for their excellent work. Our thoughts are with you during this incredibly difficult time, and we are grateful for, for your work. 2021 was an incredibly challenging year for British Columbians. And from the extreme heat wave and wildfires that tore through the village of Lytton and the surrounding communities to the flooding and landslides that we saw last November, in, in their immediate aftermath, Prime Minister Trudeau and Premier Horgan formed a committee so that we, to enable us to work together to find solutions for the collective good of communities across the province. It was a committee intended to ensure that the silos that, that existed previously among governments and among the First Nations were overcome by in, improved communication, collaboration, and cooperation between the parties. And I can advise that the work of this committee has stood as a true testament to the power of working together from government to government and nation to nation. And throughout British Columbia and right across Canada, we have seen that floods, landslides, wildfires, and other extreme weather events are affecting the lives and livelihoods of thousands of Canadians. And with some regularity, we are seeing the devastation that too, far too many communities have had to endure as a result of the real and growing threat posed by climate change. The governments of British Columbia and Canada working together with the First Nations Leadership Council, have been working to ensure that our responses to recent and future disasters are coordinated and effective, and that there is a concentrated focus on building greater resiliency for generations to come. For far too long, Indigenous people were seen as a vulnerable group when it came to disasters, when in fact their knowledge and lived experience can provide us with an opportunity as we look to better manage emergencies. They must be key partners and given the necessary resources to keep their citizens and their communities safe. And when we understand, respect and leverage their traditional knowledge, which comes from people who have been managing land and mitigating disasters for millennia, I believe all Canadians will benefit and we will be stronger for our collaborative effort together. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Regional Chief Terry Tiji, Mr. Robert Phillips from the First Nations Summit and Kupke Judy Wilson from the Union of British Columbia Indian Chiefs for their invaluable contributions to the success of this committee. And while we have short-term plans and long-term solutions to get done, let me also acknowledge that I have spoken with mayors and residents in impacted communities. And in these conversations, many of them have made it clear that what they need right now is funding so that they can return to their homes and get back to their lives. And that's why we are here this afternoon. And today I'm very pleased to announce that our, governments, our government, the Federal Government of Canada, is providing over $870 million in advance payments to the Government of British Columbia through the Disaster Financial Assistance Arrangement to support the flood, landslide and storm recovery and rebuilding efforts that are taking place right across this province. This money is in addition to the $270 million that we provided to the province last month in support of the 2021 wildfire recovery efforts. Let me also acknowledge that we know that much work is required to get communities back to where they were before these events and to prepare them for future ones, and this funding will support those efforts. This is an advance payment to a much larger commitment that the Government of Canada has made to the province of British Columbia and the people of British Columbia to help in those recovery efforts. Together, we face a significant challenge, building climate resiliency in our communities. And although this is no easy task, I take great comfort in knowing that we stand united we know that the work we are doing here today and the partnerships that have been built and now exist, the funding we are delivering, all are going to make a significant difference to make our communities stronger tomorrow and into the future. And to all the committee members, I want to offer my very sincere thank you for your partnership and your contributions. Together and with the support of an entire nation, we will make sure that communities across British, British Columbia stand ready for the impact of climate change as we go forward together. Thank you very much, merci. And I now have the honor of introducing my, my co-chair and good friend, Minister Mike Farnworth, to provide remarks. Thank you, Bill. 
Thank you, uh, thank you, Minister Blair. And uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Farnworth, the Solicitor General, and I'm honored to be here on the traditional unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. I would like to first thank my co-chair, the Honorable Bill Blair, First Nations representatives, and everyone on the committee for attending today's meeting. And for your continued support and collaboration as we've been working to help people and communities recover from recent disasters and protect them from future climate events. Thousands of people across British Columbia were hit hard last year by wildfires, floods and mudslides from the November 21, 20, 2021 atmospheric river event to the severe wildfire season last summer. And the Lytton community, which was deeply impacted by last year's fire season, is now in the throes of another wildfire. Several homes have been tragically lost on the Lytton First Nation, and BC wildfire crews are deploying extensive resources on the ground and in the air. The province is here to support the Lytton First Nation and everyone affected by this fire. We know that the impacts of climate change, our province will continue to face challenging and severe emergencies in the years ahead. And that's why it's clear that all of us, all levels of government, must work together going forward to increase our resilience. I'm thankful for the federal government's support of an advance of $870 million to the province to help us rebuild damaged infrastructure and help people get back on their feet and recover from these recent disasters. Canada, British Columbia, and the First Nations Leadership Council are also working towards a trilateral, a trilateral agreement on emergency management. This will strengthen the First Nations ability to respond to and recover from future climate-related disasters faster and is part of our work towards an Indigenous-led and culturally safe future in emergency management. We know we still have work ahead of us as we continue to rebuild and recover, but I'm grateful to the leadership and collaboration of everyone on this committee. I'm looking forward to continuing building on our partnerships as we work to mitigate future disasters and to help people and communities on the road to recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mike. Hi, everyone. Um, my thanks to, to both of you uh, for your leadership on this committee. It has been a wonderful experience to see how working collaboratively we can move forward and make sure um, we take care of people. And thank you to all the members of the committee. I just kind of scooped my last line. Um, for the focus and the steadfast commitment to delivering for the people of British Columbia. This is really an example of what partnerships can achieve when our shared goal is so clear and so important. And I think actually this is a model and a standard I hope we can continue to replicate across the country. The damage caused by the floods has been devastating. I will never forget my visit to Abbotsford with the Prime Minister last fall. We saw the destruction firsthand but we also felt the overwhelming sense of community that was present, of coming together, of resilience and of hope. We heard heartbreaking stories of what parents experienced as they packed up their kids and belongings in a car. First Nations saw their communities and ancestral territory destroyed. For persons with disabilities, you can imagine how uncertain and difficult the process of evacuation and relocation was. So today I'm thinking of every person who lost a loved one, a home, a business, livestock, or whose life was changed forever by these floods and what this relief will mean to them. This investment is not the first one in our recovery and it won't be the last. The recovery is far from over. People are still rebuilding their homes and their lives and their businesses. Together, we are rebuilding entire communities. And while this is an opportunity that we wouldn't wanna have, I really hope we use this moment to build more inclusive, accessible, and sustainable communities as we can. The federal government is always going to be there for the people of British Columbia. When a crisis happens, whether it's a pandemic or a natural disaster, our government steps up and gets support out the door when people need it the most. I'm proud to see that commitment and determination to help Canadians through the hardest times has never wavered. So I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague, Minister Sajjan. Thank you, Carla. I do want to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered today on the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And as my colleagues have mentioned, that the impact that climate change is having, that the impact is, is on our province is undeniable now. 
As we speak, wildfires near Lytton have already burned over 1,700 hectares, and firefighters continue to battle this out-of-control uh, blaze. And generally, we are experiencing disasters that are caused by climate change in increasing frequency and severity, impacting cities, towns, communities across British Columbia and Canada. This is why we need to have conversations across all levels of governments. We need to see what we can do to protect our neighbours when disaster strikes. It means investing in those who serve during these challenging times. And now, when I was working with the heavy urban search and rescue team here in Vancouver, I saw the experience and dedication of those who are already um, serving in disaster zones. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all the firefighters, Canadian Armed Forces members, Red Cross volunteers, and community members who have done so much during these disasters. And we need to continue to look at how we can build more teams like these ones to build resilience when unmanageable happens. We also need to look at how we can rebuild. As many of you are aware, the last month I was in Lytton where I met with uh, Mayor uh, Polderman and the village administration and I toured the village. I spoke with residents who lost their homes. It was also where I announced uh, on behalf of our government the $77 million in funding to help rebuild Lytton by supporting the village, its people and its businesses. Support from Infrastructure Canada will help Lytton rebuild key community buildings and Pacific Can will also deliver the Lytton Business Restart Program helping small and medium-sized businesses get back to business in Lytton, including support for Indigenous businesses and those operated by women, youth and other uh, underrepresented groups. And we're also supporting uh, homeowners who have basic um, rebuild insurance and want to rebuild in net zero and fire resistant homes. These investments um, are not just about rebuilding, they're about rebuilding better. Our work over the past few months has been about this. It's been about working together as federal, provincial, municipal and First Nations partners to plan how we should respond to floods, fires, landslides and storms. It's about working together when disasters strike to protect people's lives, homes and businesses. And it's about working together to re recover and to rebuild after. We and Pacifican and the entire federal government will be there uh, as partners to support British Columbia at their time of need. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now begin with questions from the room and then we'll move on to questions on the phone line. One question, one follow up, please. And please start by stating your name and outlet. It's uh, Gord Hookster with the Vancouver Sun. I'm just wondering, Minister Farnworth, whether you could give us a little bit details about what this uh, first $870 million will be used for. Um, it's going to be able to use to build a lot of the, uh, the damaged uh, infrastructure, uh, both uh, on the public and on the, uh, the private side, and the, uh, help with the costs that the province has already been incurring to date. So it could be everything from uh, roadworks to floodworks uh, in municipalities, uh, assisting on our, our highways and the whole area of where we've having been having to, to expend uh, funds to, 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 to rebuild. And. Uh and in terms of the flood works, does that include like, you know, some of these, you know, there's asks from municipalities on either, you know, uh, building di dikes to higher standards or, you know, looking at other alternate measures, that kind of thing. Will that be included or is this specifically on the response and recovery side? So this is on the response and recovery, but within this money and within the DFAA program, there is a 15% uh, premium that allows you to build back better. So it's not just building back to the standard that was in that, that was in place, but it allows us to build back better uh, using that premium. And at the same time, uh, that's where we've changed some of our provincial um, um, program rules to align better with the federal government program, so that we're able to make to leverage this money to ensure that we are building back better. Hi, Minister. I'm from Omiti Wiliti Lam. Uh, just wondering, like Lytton now, the fire is still out of control. So, uh, how is uh, this funding will help now the situation, uh, like for the team to f f uh, fight it? How is plan uh, for the government? Thank you. So this funding is separate from the, the fighting of the fire. The fighting of the fire is provincial money and we spend what we have to spend in terms of fighting it. I can give you an update in terms of the current situation. The fire right now is about 1,850 hectares. Um, it is holding very well on the north and south flanks. Uh, so that is away from areas of, of, uh, of, uh, human, of human habitation or power lines or infrastructure. 
Uh, the real issue right now is the, uh, it's moving in a westerly direction towards the Stein uh, Valley Provincial Park. Uh, right now, there are about 96 uh, crew, both uh, provincial firefighters, First Nations, Lytton First Nations, who are members who are fighting that fire. There are eight helicopters, uh, heavy, and some of them heavy, uh, heavy helicopters that are busy fighting the fire. Uh, we're watching the, very, the weather very closely uh, to see the, uh, the impact. We know that there has been some unsettling. There was a little bit of rain uh, that fell uh, last night, but a lot still depends on the weather. Uh, and as it, uh, but right now, the, the direction of the fire is towards the, uh, the Stein. Provincial Park. And follow up? Okay. Uh, we'll move to questions from the phone line now. Operator? Please press star 1 if you have a question. Vous pouvez appuyer sur étoile 1 si vous avez une question. The first question is from Dylan Robertson from the Winnipeg Free Press. Please go ahead. Uh, hi there. Uh, Minister Blair, uh, you met with the emergency management ministers in March and you were talking about changes in how Ottawa is providing the DFAA to try disincentivizing rebuilds in areas that are prone to flooding and fires. I'm just wondering if you could update us on what's happened since March and if that's still the government's plan. Yeah, thanks very much for the question. And, I, and it's an important one because we, we know that with, you know, the increased frequency and severity of, of climate-related events, particularly floods and fires, uh, that there are certain areas of the country that are more vulnerable. Uh, to these types of weather-related emergencies. Um, there is very important work that's, that's currently taking place in collaboration between the federal government through the National Resources Canada and our provincial and territorial partners on more effective flood ma mapping, for example. There's also very significant investments being made in, in firefighter training and firefighting equipment right across the country. Um, but, you know, we, we, we have seen that the cost of recovery from these natural events has been increasing quite significantly. And, and, it, and it's, a, it's a shared commitment between ourselves, certainly between the federal government and the province of British Columbia and, and our First Nations partners here in BC, but also among the provinces and territories right across the country, that we want to, to invest in resiliency. And, and, and that means, you know, making significant investments to help um, our, our first responders respond more effectively and quickly, um, making sure they have the resources, the training and equipment that they need to, to do their job, but also to, to working collaboratively with communities to make them far more resilient. Um, our, our intent here is to invest in prevention and better preparation, but at the same time we, we acknowledge that these are, events are taking place and we will be there to help communities uh, recover. Um, you know, you, you mentioned from Manitoba, we, we've, we have a, a very difficult uh, fire situation in Matthias Kloom, uh, Cree First Nation um, in northern Manitoba. Literally thousands of people have been displaced from their communities and, 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 and we're very grateful for the incredible work of Emergency Management Manitoba and the first responders who are, who are doing work there um, and, and we're working very collaboratively to make sure that we keep all of those people safe. And follow up? And uh, yeah, uh, my follow up is actually about the situation up in Pukatawagan. Uh, we, heard, we heard the chief has criticism of uh, how the provincial government and the Red Cross responded. The evacuation is almost done now, but she said this got to a crisis point before anyone intervened. I'm just wondering if you're familiar with how the evacuation has been going and if you had any response to that. Yeah, and, 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 and listen, I understand completely the anxiety and concern uh, that the, the chief expresses. Um, it, it, this really was a life and limb situation. Um, I can assure you that, that the federal government, working very closely with, with the province of Manitoba and with our, our civil society partners like the Red Cross, have been there in that community. Um, Canadian Armed Forces stepped up and provided uh, air transport. Also, we were able to move quite a number of people by, by rail. Those people have now been removed to safety, and, 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 but I, we also know how traumatic and difficult that that relocation can be for the people in those communities, um, but it was necessary, and, and we'll continue to work as closely and collaboratively with the First Nations leadership um, in that community and the people of that community to make sure that we can keep them safe and do everything possible to keep their community safe as well. Operator, next question. The next question is from Binder Sajan from CTV Vancouver. Please go ahead. Uh, hi there. Um, thanks for the update on the recovery and the rebuild. I'm just wondering if you're able to give some sort of an update on prevention measures that have been taking place, particularly in and around the Lytton. Um, and I'm wondering also if there was thought to, given to extend these meetings, uh, given that, you know, the rebuild is still in progress and yet Lytton's been hit again this year, or near Lytton. 
Yeah, no, thanks, uh, thanks, Binjin, for the uh, the question. Uh, well, twofold when it comes to, in case uh, the situation in Lytton, there's the fire that's ongoing right now, and there's the evacuation that's uh, that's under play, that's that is underway. About uh, 45 people have been evacuated, registered at Cache Creek about 107 at Lillooet. Obviously, they will be continuing to get the supports that they need um, until the evacuation orders are lifted. In terms of the rebuild, uh, there has been the money that's already been announced by both the, uh, the federal government, uh, the $70 million uh, just uh, recently, along with the, uh, the, the provincial uh, monies that have been, uh, have been announced in terms of the rebuild. Uh, the debris removal is, is underway, and it is our expectation that that will start uh, in, uh, in, uh, in September. Um, part of the federal money uh, is going to enable um, uh, homes that, uh, to, to, to fire smart, and the same uh, in terms of the, uh, the infrastructure, the, the municipal infrastructure uh, that is being rebuilt, uh, and the province is involved uh, with working with the, uh, the local government uh, and the First Nations in terms of the rebuild. Thanks so much. Um, so by my count, we're looking at more than a billion dollars um, so that's been spent on uh, rebuilding and recovery. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, is it going to be possible to get a number? Uh, you know, I know you get asked this all the time in terms of what the rebuild is going to cost. Or is it this going to be sort of a step by step process that every once in a while, once you get to a certain point of the rebuild, that you realize what other money is needed? And just wondering if both the province and the federal government are then committed to funding whatever that may cost. We have been working very well with the uh, the federal government. Uh, the federal government came in very early uh, with the uh, the allocation of the uh, over five billion dollars in terms of what it's going to cost for the recovery. And at that time, they indicated that they knew that that was just a first ask. Uh, we've been working very closely with them and First Nations and local governments in terms of 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 the recovery and the rebuild and how that's taking place. Uh, today's uh, announcement around the 870 million uh, is a significant step in terms of the money that, that is going to be going out the door. It is an ongoing process uh, in terms of determining exactly the, uh, the, the, the full cost of the recovery. Um, there's still some assessments going on on the ground, for example, in the valley. Uh, at the same time, there's the work that's been underway on the highways uh, in terms of the, uh, the number one and the number five and the rebuild on the Coquihalla. With still work to be done over the summer on both of those highways. Uh, as you know, highway number uh, eight uh, is, uh, and, and 12 are, uh, have significant problems where there's a lot of work that still has to be done in determining looking at things such as land that's been lost on uh, First Nations reserves. So all of those costs, it, it is in many ways an incremental process. But the critical thing here is, is that you've got the, the province and the federal government and First Nations working together to be able to get us through this and to move forward in a way where all levels of government are working together so that we're better prepared in the future. But more and just as importantly, is dealing with the situation on the ground as it is right now. Next question. The next question is from Brenna Owen from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Thank you. Yes, I'm just wondering if perhaps one of the ministers could clarify whether the $870 million announced is like entirely new or whether we've heard this amount perhaps like embedded in a larger previously announced amount. Yeah, thanks. Very, to, to be very clear, I, I was here a, a, a few weeks ago and we announced $270 million in advance payment. And that was in direct response to the 2021 fire season. The province of British Columbia and, and, and under Minister Farnworth and his staff have been working very hard to make, to put, to put the data and the, and the application before the federal government. Um, it's very clear that, that, that the rebuild from, as a result of of the November floods is going to be a significant and costly event. And this is the first advance payment in, in those applications. And so um, Mr. Farnworth has, has, has made application to the federal government. We know that $870 million is a, it's, it's the first payment, but there's more work to be done. But, but we also believe it's important to get money out as quickly as possible so that that rebuild can, can begin in earnest and that, that we can help those communities impacted by those floods 
begin to return to a sense of normalcy um, in, in their communities as quickly as possible. And, and you know, they, they, we know that people have been enormously impacted. I, like my colleagues, have been to Abbotsford and to Merritt and Princeton. And we've, we've, we've spoken to people who were directly impacted by these inc inc this incredible flooding event. Um, we are working very closely, not only with the provincial government, with our First Nations partners, but with municipalities as well. As a matter of fact, later on this afternoon, I'll be meeting with uh, mayors from the affected regions from right across British Columbia, um, because that order of government is also an important partner in this. And we want to make sure that that money is provided in a timely way to assist in that rebuild, but also it's being invested in a way which is, which is increasingly resilient to these types of events to make sure that the rebuild just doesn't take place in, an, in, a, in, a, in a vulnerable place, but is, is, is done in a way which is properly informed uh, by an acknowledgement of the impact of climate change and the fact that we just simply have to do things better. And that's what building back better is all about. Next question. Yeah, just, oh. Oh yeah, no, sir, follow up. Do I have a follow up yep. or? Yep. <laughs> I'm actually just wondering um, if perhaps the ministers could talk a little bit more about that building back better. Some mm -hmm. perhaps examples of what maybe the province is looking that, at in that regard, um, whether that's infrastructure, like highways or homes, I guess. Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll let Minister Farnworth begin talking about infrastructure because they've been primarily responsible for that, but there's a couple of things I would add after he concludes. Thanks. So I, I think the, the best example, the one that, that will come to mind for most people, is on the Coquihalla, where there has been uh, just an amazing job done in, in getting that highway up and running as one of the major arterial routes into the province. That being said, there's still significant work to be done on a number of bridges and the, uh, the, 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 the significant culverts uh, that need to be able to handle the volume of water that we saw in the, uh, in the atmospheric river. So it would be things such as uh, building and dealing with those culverts to be able to handle that. So it's not just replacing what was there, but building them up to a new standard from what we have seen from that atmospheric flood. Uh, it's working with local governments, uh, again, in a similar vein, looking at, uh, at, at choke point culverts, for example, that weren't able to, ha to handle the volume of water. Those are some of the, uh, those are some of the things in relation to the atmospheric river, uh, what, where build back better means. It is also that way in terms as it relates to fires and municipal infrastructure and fire smart programs, those kinds of things. And if I might just offer a, a, another example, and I know when we went to Lytton, and, and we saw what happened in an incredibly short period of time, about 45 minutes, and that town was completely engulfed in, in flame. We know that, you know, that in, in rebuilding that community, which we are absolutely committed to in supporting, that through, you know, perhaps more appropriate building codes, uh, we can build back a community which is far more fire resistant. And, and I think that's going to be important to the people of that community to make them less vulnerable to these types of events. And although there's a significant amount of work that's taking place with the MBC in, in making sure that there's an appropriate and timely response with through training and better equipment and, and, and better early warning systems, but as well when we do that rebuild, either in a, in a, in a fire prone area or in a flood prone area, it's important that we, we build it to standards that will make them less vulnerable to these type of future events. Thank you, next question. The next question is from Tyler Olson from the Fraser Valley Current. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, in Abbotsford, Sumas Prairie's future is largely dependent on what, if anything, the Americans do regarding the Nooksack River. Have either of you directly spoken to Deanne Criswell about what the Americans will be doing regarding that river's habit of flooding into Canada? Um, could you just repeat who you asked, who we had spoken to? We didn't, that sound, it didn't come through. Uh, sure, Deanne Cresswell, the uh, FEMA director. Oh, okay. Or uh, FEMA administrator. Okay, uh, what I can tell you right now is that there has been the, uh, the, 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 the working group established between Governor Inslee and Premier Horgan dealing with the, uh, the, the Nooksack River. Uh, and uh, getting a, a thorough uh, understanding of, of what the, uh, the potential options are. Uh, at this point, it's a little too early to say whether or not there have been conversations with, with the, uh, the head of the, uh, the U.S., uh, uh, the individual that you mentioned, but it is certainly we are raising that issue um, 
uh, with Washington State. We're working on that. Uh, the federal government is very much aware of our concern around that, and we fully expect that it is going to require the, uh, the, the involvement of both Canada uh, and the, uh, the federal government at the United States. But right now, that work has been, is very much at the local level uh, between British Columbia uh, and, uh, and Washington, Washington State and the table that's been set up there. And next question, or oh, sorry, follow-up. I have a follow-up there. Yep, sorry, follow-up. Um, oh, yes, um, okay, if it's a, if, what I've been told by a provincial spokesperson is that the uh, discussions hadn't yet begun to uh, include any uh, formal cross-border body of any kind and that the uh, conversations were quite early. Um, are there, how, how, how in-depth are those conversations at the moment? And is there actually a group looking at solutions and discussing uh, solutions um, in a, a formalized manner? Uh, what I can tell you, there have been the initial discussions around the setting up of the, uh, the table, uh, the recognition by both uh, Washington State and British Columbia that this is an issue that needs to be, that we need to be addressing. Uh, that's why uh, both Premier Horgan and, and Governor Inslee have said that this is something that needs to be addressed, and we are now in that process of doing just that. Uh, and as I said, we know full well that it is going to require, um, you know, the participation, no doubt, of, of Canada and the U.S. Uh, federal jurisdiction. I do know also at the local level uh, there is involvement from the uh, uh, local communities on, the, on the, uh, the British Columbia side of the border and of the Washington state side of the border. But it is still early days at this point. And next question. The next question is from Michelle Gusup from CBC News. Please go ahead. Following the situation in Lytton today, have you spoken to anyone in that community and what is your message to evacuees today? Um, from the moment we uh, heard of the, uh, the situation in uh, Lytton, uh, both uh, uh, Emergency Management BC and BC Wildfire Service were in communication with the uh, Lytton First Nation. I have uh, spoken with the uh, Lytton personally with the Lytton First Nation chief uh, on the, uh, the, uh, the that afternoon, along with uh, Chief Matt and, uh, uh, Chief Matt Pasco, uh, to let them know that uh, the province is doing everything that they can and that the evacuees will be supported uh, with the uh, the resources and the supports that they need. Uh, I also spoke with the uh, the local MLA for the area uh, and. Uh, outlined uh, what was being done in terms of the equipment and the, uh, the resources on the ground in terms of personnel involved to, uh, to fight the fire. And follow-up? And looking at the fire situation across the country, it's been a relatively quiet wildfire season with some exceptions. Are you concerned about what's to come in August and that people may not be prepared to leave if the situation does worsen? Well, I'll respond to the British Columbia part first and then turn it to Minister Blair to talk about the rest of the country. Um, so far in British Columbia, the, uh, I, think the, uh, I think all of us are pleased uh, by what we have seen so far. Um, you know, there was a lot of concern that we would see a repeat of last year where the fire season started back in April. We're now in mid-July and really the Lytton fire is the, main, is the first real sort of fire of note. Uh, in the province. Uh, the weather uh, to date has been cooperating, but we do know as we move into, uh, into the second half of July and into August, that that's traditionally when that high uh, pressure ridge that brings the sunny weather to the province uh, forms and, uh, and we can expect uh, you know, the hot, hot and dry temperatures. Uh, the main message is this, uh, the BC Wildfire Service is prepared and has the resources necessary uh, to, to, to fight the fires in this province. Emergency Management BC has the, the people on the ground, the volunteers on the ground, and will have the supports and services if there needs to be evacuations. Local governments have their emergency plans in place. But what's critical, of course, is that when there are evacuation alerts or evacuation orders, that people follow the instructions on that local level. Uh, that's the most important thing. Along with that, uh, people need to recognize that when there's a campfire ban out there, you observe it. You don't flick cigarette butts um, out, uh, you know, out, out the car window. Uh, some basic common sense. But uh, the reality is, is that I think we are in this province in a good situation right now uh, for, the, uh, for the fire season at present and for the coming, uh, the coming months ahead. And now I'll ask Minister Blair in terms of the rest of the country. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much, and 
Uh, very similar to in the situation in British Columbia, first of all, we're, we are seeing significant fire events in northern Manitoba and in the Yukon. Um, I, I can tell you we work very closely in the federal government with our provincial and territorial partners. Um, they all take exactly the same approach. We hope for the best, but we plan for the worst. And everyone is, is working diligently to make sure that we are prepared to respond and we know how impactful that these types of fire events can be, uh, particularly on places where people live and, and the, the impact of, you know, on transportation, on supply lines, et, et cetera. So we all remain very committed to, to being vigilant and to being prepared to respond. And when these events take place, and they do take place, it's a vast country, and there are many places in, in Canada vulnerable to, to wildfire, we make sure, we make sure we're in partnership with provinces and territories that we are ready to respond quickly to make sure that our first responsibility, of course, is the safety of all Canadians, uh, but also the safety of their communities. And, and so we're working very closely together. We, we remain hopeful, but you know, we're seeing evidence, as we saw last year in British Columbia, this year in Manitoba and in the Yukon, that these, these events can be hugely impactful on, on Canadians in different parts of the country. And so we stand ready to respond as required. And next question. The next question is from Curtis Deering from City News Vancouver. Please go ahead. Well, hi, uh, Minister Blair. This $870 million being fast-tracked today plus the $207 million um, last month, was that all earmarked in the most recent federal budget? The, the $870 million was a commitment, it is part of a commitment that we made in the immediate aftermath of the flooding that occurred um, in November in, in British Columbia. Our government made a commitment um, in, uh, based on the first estimates provided to us by British Columbia of, of up to $5 billion in support, and this is part of that. And so, so it has been acknowledged uh, by our government, and, and this is the first advance payment. We recognize how important it is to get money out to, to the provinces and through the provinces to communities as quickly as possible, and we've all been working very well together um, over the past several months to, to make that happen. This is the first advance payment, and it's $870 million, by the way. Um, the first advance payment, and, and, I, and we're very confident it'll be put to, to good use quickly by the province of British Columbia, and we stand ready to continue that support um, as, as their, their, the data on their application continues to be submitted to us. And follow-up? Yeah, you mentioned a $5 billion figure there. This would suggest then that there is still potentially over $4 billion in aid to BC still yet to come. The original estimate that we received with respect to the damage that might be uh, eligible for disaster financial assistance or application from the British province of British Columbia included the figure of $5 billion and we made a commitment that they we would be there for the province and for the people of British Columbia with that funding. I think it's a good opportunity to, to also acknowledge um, the, the Insurance Bureau of Canada has recently re released data that suggests that the, the insured damage in British Columbia exceeds $890 million, um, a, a, a significant amount as well. We recognize and we've had conversations with communities, with First Nations, uh, with the people across British Columbia, and of course working very closely with the, with the province of British Columbia. There was a great deal of damage as a result of, 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 of these, these floods. There's a great deal of recovery investment that needs to be made, and we want to make sure that that investment is done not only in a timely way, but that it's effective to help those communities build back in a more resilient and, and safer way. And follow up? I'm sorry, your line is open. Uh, no follow-up, thank you. Okay, next question. The next question is from Jane Skripnik from Black Press Media. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, Minister Farmers, you mentioned that part of the $870 million will go to help the province with recovery efforts it's already taken. So I just want to confirm that some of that amount will be used to reimburse the province for money it's already spent. And if that is the case, I'm wondering how much of that $870 is already spent and how much is, uh, is new funding or so new funding that has been spent then. The DFAA program is a program that designs to assist the provinces in coping with, with significant disaster expenses which we are facing. Uh, and, and normally it can take quite some time for the provinces to get this money, which is why the, the, uh, the federal government's advance payment is so important to us because it assists us in getting money out the door uh, even faster uh, to where it's needing. So dealing not just with the ongoing work, but with the work that we are identifying that needs to be done. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's how 
how the, uh, the, 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 the money will be allocated uh, to the different areas where, where recovery uh, is, is taking place and different projects. And follow up? Yeah, I'm hoping um, you can provide a bit of a timeline on when the re remainder of the approximately $4 billion um, will be headed BC's way. Well, that's we as 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 damage assessment takes place, as the repair works take place, as the recovery takes place, we work with the federal government, giving them the data and the information that they need in order uh, to determine, you know, the the exact costs uh, that are being incurred by the province. Uh, but right from the very beginning, uh, both the province uh, and the federal government understood the scope of the disaster uh, and the significant amount of money that it was going to cost to be a recovery. And so the federal government came very early on and said, look, <clears throat> we know it's going to cost. We've already looking at the $5 billion. They've now made this advance payment of $870 million. And so that uh, is obviously extremely uh, uh, helpful to us. Uh, and I expect the rest of the money will come uh, as, uh, as more and more recovery work is undertaken and that we're giving those that, that information to the, uh, the federal government. Uh, and we have time for one last question and follow up on the phone line. Thank you. The next question is from David Rivoli from The Logic. Please go ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, I'd like each uh, Mr. Farnworth and Mr. Blair to tackle this question in a very slightly different way. Uh, I realize today's announcement is about disaster recovery, uh, repairing some stuff we've already experienced. But, uh, Mr. Farnworth, in BC, what would your top priority be for a project to uh, prepare for future disasters? And then, Mr. Blair, outside BC, uh, what do we need to be doing specifically? Um, <clears throat> thank you uh, for that question. Well, there's a whole range of issues that, uh, that we need to take into account in terms of preparing for the future moving forward. So within my ministry, for example, the, uh, the critical piece of legislation that oversees all of uh, emergency management in British Columbia is the Emergency Program Act, uh, which is undergoing a significant rewrite and co-development with First Nations. And so that is really going to be the foundation upon which emergency management uh, is taking place in the province moving into the future. At the same time, we also recognize uh, the work that needs to be done in terms of understanding uh, the situation with our diking structure. And so the diking strategy is that work is underway within the Ministry, in, within the ministry of Forests. So those are forward-looking initiatives that are critical priorities for us that are underway. Um, important uh, changes that have been made in terms of our ability to deal with disasters. Some of them were announced in, in, the, in the recent budget that was tabled this year. So moving the BC Wildfire Service to a year-round operational uh, a model as opposed to just a seasonal model will be a significant change. Along with that um, is the, uh, the, the uh, additional infrastructure money that has been put in place so that local governments can start to do uh, planning that they need at their level to understand better local uh, issues, whether it's local floodplain issues, whether it is uh, understanding the slope stabilities from the areas that have been burnt using LIDAR, uh, being able to deal with the smaller infrastructure projects that remove some of the choke points in their communities. So it really is a combination of immediacy, medium, and long-term uh, initiatives that, uh, that, are, uh, that are underway. And, I, and as I listen to Mr. Farnworth, it, it strikes me that our, our priorities are very much aligned because I think our first responsibility is to ensure that first responders um, and those who also come in behind first responders like the Canadian Red Cross are adequately uh, resourced and supported in order to do the important job of saving Canadian lives and, and, and dealing in the first response to these types of emergencies. And so th there's a great deal of work that needs to be done to improve our early warning systems to make sure that, that, they, that our first responders have the adequate training, um, resources and support that they need to do their job and that we can then help communities um, it respond and, and, and recover quickly from these types of disasters. But we also recognize that with the increased frequency and severity of climate-related disaster emergencies across this country, um, there needs to be a significant investment. And, and part of that is done, and we, we talked a lot this morning about the disaster financial assistance arrangement, which is money that comes through the federal government to the province to help in recovery. And there is, as Mr. Farnworth indicated, a component within the DFAA to allow for up to 15% to be invested in resilience and, and that building back better. 
but we also know that other investments are going to be required in our, in our conversations with community in, in communities in British Columbia and right across Canada, it's very clear that we need to make significant investment in disaster mitigation and adaptation as a result of the increased frequency of these types of events as a result of climate change. And that's work that is long term. And it, it is we're going to require a strong commitment from all three orders of government, from First Nations working collaboratively together and in a coordinated way to make sure that we make those in investments that can make the, big, the greatest difference as quickly as possible. We know that in, in a country as vast as Canada, we are still going to see flooding and fire events. And so we need to be able to respond appropriately to them. But we also need to make investments to protect Canadians from these types of events and other uh, natural disasters that, that, that threaten our, our communities and our citizens. And so we are committed to making those investments as well. And, 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 and if I may, just refer back to the important work that's been taking place in the Joint Committee that, 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 that has been struck between the province, the federal government, and First Nations here in British Columbia in response to the flooding events. Those conversations in immediate response and recovery, but also in long-term investments, and the things that we have to do together and how we, do, how we work more, more effectively together to, to create a, a safer environment for all Canadians has been a very important part of this work, and it's work that will continue. And, al and although that we, we have reached um, a, a, the conclusion of some of our work, we recognize the importance of continuing to work collaboratively together, all of us. And, and you know, so there, there are ongoing discussions later today um, with, with mayors and municipal leaders across this country, tomorrow with First Nations leaders, um, and, and there'll be continued, obviously, uh, collaborative work between the province and the federal government as we work together to respond. And follow up? I'll direct my follow up to, yeah, I'll direct my follow up to Mr. Blair. Um, I'll give you another chance to, to maybe give something specific. What do you think is Canada's most fragile piece of major infrastructure? What keeps you up at night? Keeping people safe is, is, is our most important responsibility, and, and we know that Canadians are threatened by these types of, of, of natural events. We've also seen the impact on, on, on critical supply chains. Uh, here in British Columbia, that that, that you know immediately caused caused great concern over you know pe people's livelihoods and and getting critical um, goods and services to places in Canada where they are needed, and and so quite frankly, the safety and, and security of of Canadian critical infrastructure and Canadian citizens uh, quite appropriately keeps us up at, at night a lot. We 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 are concerned, but I also want. Uh, to, to commend the excellent work that's being done by our first responders and those in, in both in all orders of government who work very carefully to make sure that we're there for to protect Canadians, and and so you know these these types of events I think deepen our resolve to continue to work collaboratively together to do what is necessary to keep people safe. And our very last question in the room. Yes, yeah, could we be uh, uh, Alexandre from Radio Canada? Can you have an uh, answer in French? Oui. Ask the question in English, but... Non, tu um, peux poser en français. Ah, super. Okay. Vous avez parlé d'un accord trilatéral avec les Premières Nations. Comment ça va marcher concrètement Comment les Premières Nations vont être euh, mieux, en fait, inclus, euh, incluses dans, les, dans la gestion des urgences Alors, euh, aujourd'hui, on a annoncé 870 millions dans l'heure sur le programme Assistance et Aide Financière des Catastrophes. On a travaillé des ministres euh, du gouvernement fédéral, des ministres du gouvernement provincial, puis les, les leaders des Premières Nations au cours des mois passés. Um, ça, c'est la première étape, mais l'autre étape importante, c'est ce que vous disiez, c'est cet accord. Alors, euh, dans l'histoire du euh, comment on a géré ces sortes de catastrophes, on n'a pas... On n'a pas travaillé très proche avec les, les Premières Nations. On a perdu beaucoup leur information, leur... Euh, Their knowledge historique et c'était très um, ça marchait pas c'était très c'était pas dans l'esprit de Andrep. Alors maintenant on travaille les trois niveaux du gouvernement le fédéral provincial première nation pour établir un, un accord. Ce n'est pas tout à fait fini c'est la raison pour laquelle on a, ne l'a pas annoncé aujourd'hui mais c'est très proche et ça va ça va être le roadmap pour comment on va travailler ensemble dans le futur avec les trois niveaux de gouvernement ici à BC. Mais à mon avis, ça va être un, un exemple pour le reste du Canada pour comment on peut gérer et utiliser um, le, 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 le knowledge traditionnel des Premières Nations dans le futur. Ça arrive bientôt, c'est ça? ça? Sorry? Ça arrive bientôt. Ça, ça arrive bientôt, oui, mais moi, je ne vais pas scouper mes collègues. 
All right, thank you so much. That concludes today's event. Have a nice day.